Welcome into the Hoffman Show. That's a podcast where we go a little bit deeper than we can on the radio. There's a chance you heard some of this on the radio, but if you're listening to the podcast or watching on YouTube, this is the full conversation with ESPN's Sebastian Salazar. Sebi, what's up, man? Live from Doha. Yep, live from Doha. Actually, yesterday was the first day that we didn't have a show since we got here. We've been going every single day with Football Americas, which you can uh, see on ESPN Plus, 4 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, yeah, it was nice to have a day off. And then at the same time, I was like, I need my fix. I need my game. So uh, <laughs> I'm not that far away from kicking off the quarterfinals. Yeah, I do want to talk a little bit about the quarterfinals, perhaps at the end of the conversation, if we have time. But the, the main purpose for doing this is kind of an autopsy of the U.S. men's national team. Obviously, their run comes to an end in the round of 16. And I've been looking to have this conversation with someone. And you've been our go-to guy for this entire World Cup. So nobody, uh, plus you're my friend. So no, nobody else I'd rather have this with than you. But um, as you think of like, I don't want to like lead you in any specific direction to start. And then, then I very much do, because I would like to explore my thoughts on, on the thing. Uh, but as you think of why the U S is no longer uh, playing, uh, what's the top line or top line items that come to mind for you? The United States is just not a top 10 team. And I think we have to put into context, like what this tournament is from the group phase. You start with 32 and then you hack it down to 16. And I think, When you get down to 16, there's still space for emerging nations. There's still space for teams that are maybe not that good. The jump from the round of 16 to the quarterfinals is a light year because that means that you're in the top 10 of the world and it means that you've beaten another top 10 team. And and that's really what it takes to advance in these knockout tournaments, World Cup, you'll see at the European Championships. Copa America, Gold Cup, the the tournaments that we play on our side of the world are a little bit different and much less competitive. But when you look at this U.S. team, as talented as they are, and it is the most talented generation that we've ever seen, they measured up against the Dutch side that was not the most talented Dutch side that we've ever seen. In fact, they made the final in 2010. They made third place in 2014. And people back home in Netherlands, because I talked to one of our colleagues at ESPN Netherlands, Pascal Camperman, on our show, and he was like, people think this team is boring. They're shutting off the televisions. Like, that's what they were thinking of the team that worked the United States, right? So there are levels to this. And I think to really kind of grind down in on it, it's the level of the players and the level of the coaching. And I'm I'm not going to sit here and trash Greg Berhalter yet because I think we'll probably get into his status, his performance, and everything else. Yeah. It's really more an acknowledgement of, of the guy who's in charge of the Dutch team, Louis van Gaal. This is a world-class manager. And so much of soccer, for those people that like don't know it and maybe don't love it, don't appreciate it in that way, does come down to tactics. Because the U.S. had good players, right? They had players that were good enough to, on a given day, beat a team even as good as the Netherlands. That's the reality of soccer. That there's so few goals scored that upsets are, are more prevalent in soccer than in any other sport. But... The tactic setup was naive from the United States. It was brave, but it was naive. The Dutch setup was perfect, and the Dutch players were better. So when you put that together, out of 10 games, if you played them, Netherlands was always going to win eight or nine. And specifically on this day, their good players had a good day. Their good players are still better than our good players who didn't have a good day. And then our coaching staff kind of botched the game plan. It's easy to say that now, hindsight's twenty twenty. Um, had there been some things gone differently in the early moments of that game, maybe we wouldn't see see this game plan have, having gone out that way. But I think it's pretty clear that the Dutch had a plan and what happened in the game was exactly how they would have drawn it up. Right, and to the point that Van Gaal kind of said beforehand like he almost goaded them into it's it like oh wow their their attacking play is is so nice and then of course it's they just brought him in brought him in created a whole bunch of space for the dutch counterattack. and uh, not only that uh, the u.s was exhausted um you know and it's something that uh, whether it's some of the players like a donovan on, on fox's coverage or i heard jesse march in an interview uh, who was an assistant on that 2010 team uh with roger bennett uh over at men and blazers talk about in 2010 
because they had spent so much energy in the group stages, by the time they got to the round of 16, they were exhausted and then Ghana ran them off the field. They had lost the game before the, the first whistle even blew. Um, and, and to an extent that it seems to be what happened here as well. Like everyone points to Tyler Adams on that first goal. Whoa, why didn't he get back? Because he had no gas in the tank to go anywhere. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that gets, starts to get into some of Burhalter, but not even in game in hindsight, is there the roster construction? Is that kind of where the problems start with the U.S. and, and how it was even and, and roster construction? I think the number nine is something we'll, we'll have to talk about more in depth. But also how it was deployed. Was there an opportunity to, for a little bit more rotation? Uh, where you know, if if you establish the goal as getting as far in the tournament as possible, not just getting out of the group stage, do you perhaps play the group stage a little bit differently from a squad rotation standpoint to try to leave yourself a chance with some of your best players not gassed by the round of 16. Yeah. Had Greg Berhalter been thinking about anything beyond the round of 16 and been executing on that, he would have been incredibly irresponsible and a wild dreamer. So he should have planned this as a four game tournament, right? That's the most important thing. Get out of the group and then you pick up the pieces of what's left and you throw everything you have at the board. The, The other kind of point to mention on your first question is the U S is very rarely ever going to come out of a, at least this United States going to come out of a group at the World Cup as the top team, which means you're always going to be that second team. You're always going to be playing the winner of the other group, which is going to be an elite team. And so when I talk about like the gap between Netherlands players and American players, I'm not just talking about, oh, they're technically better. Or in this case, if you want to go take it to the manager, the manager is more experienced. They've been doing it a lot longer and a lot better than us. So they have a depth of players that they can lean on so that they weren't as tired. So the United States doesn't have that. When we talk about quality, we're not just talking about the skill difference between the top 11 guys on each team. We can look at the Dutch roster and say, okay, they got 16 dudes, all of whom would take a spot of an American guy. The U.S. has 11 or 12 dudes who can can compete at the highest level possible. And then you start dropping further and further down into that into those depth charts and the level would have dropped off significantly. And, and let's, let's look at what the U S did in the group phase. Yes. They go through second. Yes. They go through undefeated. If there's a penalty call on Carter, Cameron Carter Bakers in the last seconds of that game against Iran, and there very well could have been, there was a VAR yeah. review. They don't go through. So it wasn't some dominant performance. They needed every single ounce of energy from the players that was expended in the group phase just to survive, just just to make it to the round of 16. Now, to your point about Burhalter, one thing that was interesting is that before the tournament, he was you know, very guarded, as you would expect a manager to be. But one of the few things that he kind of let on was that he was going to use his subs in this tournament. He was really going to lean on the fact that in this World Cup, you now had five subs as compared to three in the past. And he was going to kind of try and try and take some of that onus off his guys. He did use subs, but the one place that he very specifically didn't use subs was in midfield. We talk about it, it was that, that three-man midfield that everybody fell in love with, the MMA midfield, Tyler Adams, Eunice Moose, and Weston McKinney. And those three guys didn't get subbed because the drop-off to the next dudes was massive. Okay, The, the next option in, in midfield was a guy like Kellen Acosta, who's a... a good MLS player, but not in Europe. And he's in his you know, mid to late 20s now. So that kind of tells you what his career trajectory is. The other is Luca De La Torre, a young player that's very technical, but can't even get a game right now for his middle of the table team in Spain, right? So Weston McKinney's at a massive club like Juventus. Yunus Musa is wanted by some of the biggest clubs in the world. And he's an every week starter for Valencia, a very historically important team in Spain. And Tyler Adams is starting every single freaking week in the Premier League. The drop from those three dudes down to the next yep. is significant. And that's not on Greg Berhalter. That's on youth coaching, the U.S. Soccer Federation, and how they how they grow the game, and the fact that we don't have, for as many people that are not just in the United States, but playing soccer, boys specifically, because we're talking about the men's national team that plays soccer in the United States, we should have a very deep talent pool. We don't. Yet, I think we'll get there someday. But I think that's really what you saw against the Dutch. You saw one team that had rotated quite a bit of its midfield, which is where you do most of the running. Another team that had not rotated its midfield at all. 
And then you have the technical proficiency of the Dutch players. And I think anybody even that don't know soccer saw it in that first goal. It was, it was pinball. Bing, 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 bing. It was like one team was, you know, operating with ease and the others were, were chasing. And, and that was the reality. And a tired team chasing is always going to end like yeah, that. Yeah. Like that counterattack ended with the ball in the back of the net. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, so much of my World Cup viewing experience was influenced by your colleague at ESPN, Ryan O'Hanlon, and the book he just wrote. I don't know if you've read it, uh, Net Gains. I've not. But it's, it's, I got a copy of it, but it's sitting on my desk. It was supposed to come over here in the airplane, but I haven't read it yet. Uh, yeah, you, uh, you know, you've been a little busy. I think that's Ryan will forgive you. I will forgive you. Uh, but it, it's so interesting reading it. Like my timeline reading it was as I watched all this unfold. So the, you know, I obviously have been following the, the sport for a while. It's not like I came in, knew nothing, read this book and was like, wow, I am enlightened. But my understanding of the game because of some of the data and some of the ways that some of the smartest people in the world uh, that are quoted in the book think about it was so enhanced. And it was kind of, it was funny, um, but also not because they lost. Um, reading a particular chapter about midfield while or I think it was the night before uh, the game or maybe it was the day after the game. It was, it was right around the, the Netherlands game. And basically the conclusion is that of the three uh, thirds of the field, midfield is the least important because you are defending your goal or you are trying to score goals. And that is where the game is won and lost. And then midfield is the area in between, even though historically, culturally speaking, it is a very glorified position. And it was sad and funny and depressing reading it because you're like, oh, we're great in the area that we don't like that has the least actual impact on the sport. Uh, while we are incredibly weak in the area that is most important, which is scoring goals. And that leads to Greg Berhalter's uh, decision-making process up front in that final third where the U.S. struggled mightily in this tournament. How much of this is some of the same factors you were just talking about, the lack of players available versus Berhalter making a decision, uh, especially someone with a club background you know, where system is incredibly important, uh, and, and kind of getting the guys who you think fit your system versus taking a Jordan Pifak, taking a Ricardo Pepe, uh, and and leaving a Jesus Ferreira uh, at home and just bringing the best talent and, and finding a system that makes that work. Like, did the U.S. actually have the talent available in the pool and not bring it? Or is this a lack of talent overall in the system? There's a little bit of both. Let, let me address the point about midfield first. Um I don't agree that it's the least important. It's the least determinant. Like soccer can be very simplified to, did your goalie have a good day? Did your striker have a good day? And that's the reality. Like if you're clinical yeah. finishing and you only create three chances, but you finish three of them and you concede 15 chances, but your goalie makes 14 saves, you win three to one. Um, and, and so you've won that game, right? But so much of what happens in the final third, both defensively and in attack, is based upon what happens in midfield. Take that Dutch goal, for instance. That, is, that starts at the back for the Dutch. The American midfield gets totally in a, in a very, what would only happen to like young kids, and that's what they are. They turn the athleticism against them. They say, hey, come over here, chase this ball over here. We'll work it out of you quickly. And then the final third is easy for the Dutch. Well, that happens because the entire American midfield, which covers the back line, has been sucked out. Dumfries has a, a ton of time to drop it off to Memphis to buy, who has a ton of that's a That's a training drill for those guys. And that right. happens because of execution in midfield. So midfield is, is for some, arguably not, not the most important part of the field. But I would say it's it's... I would only word it as least determinant because like it. it right. Doesn't... And I think that's, that's an important clarification. And, and certainly what I was trying to say, and if I did a poor job, I apologize. It's not like it doesn't matter. Like, ah, who cares? Like put me, put me and you out there in the midfield and we're fine. <laughs> no, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I don't know perhaps you're an excellent midfielder. I would be terrible. Uh, but of the three, yeah. it is the least determinant. I like that, that yeah. phrasing. Um, and it's actually kind of funny to sidebar uh, back into the book, but it's, it's kind of like, it's also the hardest to quantify yes. and often some of the top clubs in the world literally look at other clubs that are being successful and just go, 
okay, that guy's playing midfield at that club that's winning. We don't really know why, but he's going to come play for us, and it works. Like that. That's the data uh, on midfield for a lot of really high-end clubs because midfield is so hard to quantify what the actual, to, to use your word, uh, determinant skills are. But obviously, to the, to the number nine part, we know what that determinant skill is, and that is putting the ball in the back of the net. So I'll, I'll kind of give you what I understand of Berhalter's decision-making with the three, and then we'll go into the guys that, that weren't brought in. So, and I didn't like this. Instead of bringing, let's say you're going to a construction site and you need, you know, you're going to need hammers. Instead of bringing your biggest three hammers, he brought one hammer, like a screwdriver and a wrench. And he wanted to have different options in that position. So Josh Sargent, I'll start with, I'll start with Jesus Ferreira. Ferreira is the least solid, like target of the number nines. He's the most fluid player there. He's actually, when he plays for FC Dallas and major league soccer, he's not really a nine. He's a more of an attacking center midfield 10, a false nine. They call it. You have a lot yeah. of freedom to go around. You check very deep. You don't, you don't maintain kind of that high posture and occupy the center backs, right? So he's kind of the softest version, the lightest version of a number nine. The other player that he brought, which is a surprise for a lot of people, was Haji Wright. Haji Wright is six foot three, six foot four. He's scoring a ton of goals in the last two months in Turkey. He'd hardly been called into the program before that, but he was deemed by Berhalter as the most as the best of the kind of goal-getting traditional target number nines. So he brought one of that. And then he brought Josh Sargent, who is, in his words, in Berhalter's words, the hybrid. He's got some of the movement capability of a Jesus Ferreira and the ability to bring others into play, right? That's really what you want from a false nine. You're almost saying, my goals are going to come from elsewhere and this dude's going to facilitate as opposed to what most teams do, which is say the guy at the top has to be the guy that finishes the moves, right? So it, it's kind of going outside the box, right? It, it, it's, it's changing kind of what the traditional role is. Sargent was, was kind of a happy medium between the two. He can play as a target with his back to goal. He's not as tall as Haji Wright. He's probably, well, he definitely wasn't as on fire from a goal scoring standpoint as Haji Wright, though he came in on a pretty good streak at the club that he was playing on in England. So, when Sargent kind of plays the first game, and I think plays well, but maybe not great, then you see Haji Wright get the second game, and then he goes back to Sargent in the third and, and critical game. What he's telling you is Sargent's my guy. And a lot of us who watch this team always sense that, because if you go back to the beginning of qualifying, when everybody was healthy and Berhalter was starting this process, the first two games of qualifying go to Sargent. So that was a tell there, that, that if this guy was playing half decent, Greg likes him a lot. When Sargent goes down in that third game, the decision to bring three different pieces kind of screws you. So you can't go really back to Haji Wright because he, he, he didn't want to go back to the target number nine. So all he's left with that's similar to, Fere to Sargent is Ferreira, who is an MLS player. So he's not at the quality of some of the guys over in Europe. He might get there one day, but he's not that now. And beyond that, being an MLS player, you've sat out the last two months because the season for this guy ended in, I think, October 23rd was his last game. It was, and they made the playoffs. So he's got a month without, like, real serious competition. And then on top of that, he went ice cold goals-wise at the end of the MLS season. So he's not hot in a scoring sense, and he's not really playing at a high level generally. And then on top of that, he's not getting competitive games. So Jesus Ferreira starts that game almost by default, where had Greg Berhalter gone a different route and had said, you know what, I'm just going to bring the best three forwards. He probably ends on Sargent, right? He probably ends on Ricardo Pepe, who was a big part of the qualifying process, then made a, what I think was an ill-advised move at the club level. He left Major League Soccer to go to a team in Germany that was in basically the bottom of the table. 
And he went on an 11-month scoring drought, and he fell out of the national team. But over the summer, he made a move to Holland and started scoring goals again. And we know Berhalter liked him because he used him in qualifying. So we were all very, very confident that Ricardo Pepe was going to make the roster. The other guy in there that you mentioned is Jordan Pifa, who is that big target nine goal scorer. And he did it in Switzerland, got a big move to a good team in Germany that's having a great start to their season. And PFOC has had a good start, not a great start to the season, got a couple goals, a few assists over there in Germany. The team is doing very well. And so you thought, okay, PFOC, Pepe, Sargent kind of makes a lot of sense. Haji Wright came out of nowhere. I mean, he started scoring goals in Turkey. As I said, he wasn't. That, that was a shock pick. So I think there's two ways we can criticize Burhalter here. One, the decision to bring a Haji Wright was kind of like going with a hot hand to a fault. You had other guys that were pretty hot that were more flexible for you tactically. Pepe, Pifak and, and Wright are basically similar. Pepe can do some of the, the interlinking play. He's got some of that in his game. Beyond that, this World Cup, you had 26 players available to you. In every other World Cup recently, you've had 23. On those three extra spots, why not bring a fourth forward? Why, right. when you have questions about that position and, and a pool of players that, that, you're, that you can't really see a difference between, why not use one of those spots on a fourth forward? Mexico didn't do it either. Mexico had a lot of guys that were fighting for those three spots, and the manager was very, I'm only taking three forwards. I mean, sometimes managers don't do the obvious thing. And to me, it was very, very obvious that one of those extra spots you have to use on a position where you might need something different. Because as any soccer fan will tell you, when you're chasing a goal at the end of the game, what do you do? You throw on more forwards. That's what you do. Right. So I think, I think that was something that you could very easily criticize Burhalter for. Between PFOC and, and Haji Wright, I'll let Greg Burhalter take Wright and, and just say, well, Greg Berhalter knows more about soccer than I do. If he thinks that Wright was better, you know, that's fine. But to leave a Pepe out on a 26-man roster uh, and then to be forced into the fourth game to basically have to start a guy that I don't think you really wanted to start, to start a guy for de by default, um, you know, really kind of leaves you, leaves you in a bad spot and leaves you in a situation where you got to sub that guy off at 45. And what did they do? They actually, at that, at that point, did something that everybody had been clamoring for a long time, which is abandon the nine entirely. Because if there's a position or role where the U.S. is strong, it's in the wide, central, like hyper-attacking players. You've got Pulisic, you've got Wei, you've got Reyna, you've got Aronson. It'd be great to get all those guys on the field at once. And that's what he does at halftime. He brings Reyna on, Gio Reyna finally, which people have been screaming for, and he plays him through the middle as a nine. The problem with that is, Craig, it's a little bit fantasy football. For some reason, so many managers don't truly abandon the nine. They might play a false nine, a light nine, like a Jesus Ferreira, but they don't just throw up a winger and have him play through the middle, right? Like every fan wanted to see that because on an 11, it looks very dangerous. On a graphic, it's like, whoa, our best players are on the pitch. But I think you need a target. I think you need somebody to occupy the center backs. And so once the U.S. did that, and it happened in the first half for Fedeta too. You, you just saw the mismatch. Like Virgil van Dijk is looking at Gio Reyna and Jesus Fedeta when they're his, his, his opponent. Virgil van Dijk is a star center back. Yeah. That's one of the best in the world. And he, they're, they're like children to him. He's just bullying them. And, and he's like 6'5 and yeah. massive. And, you know, Ferreira's 5'9. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so the idea that he's going to be the, this guy who occupies space. It's like, at that point, what's the point of trying to, you know, it, it, it is really putting the false in false nine. Yes. Like at that point, just play Reyna, just play, right. play Aronson, play the better player who's going to be able to do the thing that you're asking for anyway, because you're not going to be able to have the target type of forward in the middle to occupy the space, to win headers, to, to hold up play, to do any of the things you'd want out of the nine position, because you have a guy, like you said, who's out of form just by the nature of his season ended two months ago. He wasn't in particularly great form by the end of it. And now he's playing the toughest player he's probably ever played in his life. And by the way, their other center back is pretty freaking good too. Yeah. And he hadn't played a minute. He didn't play a minute in the group phase. And then started right. the round of 16. The last player to do that for the U.S., by the way? Greg Berhalter. Greg Berhalter, 2002.
Incredible. I think Greg just saw that and he was like, you know what? I have a chance to make it history. For me, it worked um, for me against Mexico. And it did. It, they, you know, they brought him in against Mexico. They won that game. They got to the quarters. And sometimes you, you look a little too far into the past and, and it can burn you. All right, let's wrap up with this. Where does this team go from here? Obviously, three and a half years instead of four yep. because of this, uh, this uh, adjusted calendar. Uh, you have apparently U.S. soccer entering into negotiations with Burhalter, which has sent the soccer world, soccer Twitter, uh, up in arms. Um, where, where do you think they go from here? And also, where should they go from here? I was listening to your partner on Football Americas, uh, Hercules Gomez, yesterday, just saying flat out, no, I do not think Burhalter should be the coach moving forward. Um, what do you think, and, and where, where do you think they go? So I want to say this first. I don't think that Greg Berhalter should – I don't think Greg Berhalter is the guy to take this team to a next level. I think Greg Berhalter's done a damn good job. And I think I don't disagree with that. I think people. Yeah. I think those both those things can be true. And I think you know there are folks like Herc who have hammered him throughout the qualification process, and will just not give him his flowers. And I think it's important to note a few things about him. He picks this program up in a disastrous situation, not just after failing to qualify for a World Cup, but after 13 months of kind of the program just sitting and rotting with an interim coach, right? Nothing was happening. They weren't really bringing in the young guys, some of them, but it was still some of the veterans getting called in. And he took a really serious decision when he, when he picked this team up. He's like, you know what? I'm abandoning the veteran core. I'm abandoning the dudes that didn't get us qualified. And there were some big names in there, Michael Bradley, Josie Altador. At that point, those guys were still at the top of the American depth chart. And he moved on from those guys and then went through qualifying and blooded all of these kids who you just saw, you know, go toe to toe with England in places like El Salvador and Costa Rica. And he qualified the U.S. pretty comfortably. Like if you go back to the end of qualifying, as they get to that last game against Costa Rica, as long as they didn't lose like six, nothing, they were still going through automatically. To me, that's basically getting it done with a game in hand, which is. In World Cup qualifying, if you're cinched before the last game, like, that's bravo, yeah. bravo. You, you've done a great job. So I think he deserves a lot of credit on that front. I think another area that, you know, we could lose sight of now, which really help, factors into the talent pool, is his, his ability to create, one, a positive vibe in the group, and then specifically make that manifest itself in the successful recruiting of dual nationals. Ricardo Pepe could have chosen Mexico chose the United States. Serginho Des could have chosen Netherlands, chose the United States. Yunus Musa is the biggest mm -hmm. recruiting win of all because he could have chosen a variety of countries, but very specifically, he was in the English setup from U15 through U18. The English youth national teams identified him, put, brought him in. He got over 30 youth national team appearances for England and Burhalter stole him from right out from underneath them. That, to me, is a massive recruiting win. That's like in college football, you're going across state lines, you're Ohio State, you're going to Michigan, and, and you get their five-star guy. That's, that's something, and the way that the United States and, and the reality of kind of the American diaspora, if we want to call it that, is there's a lot of kids like that. And Greg Burhalter being able to bring those kids in is massive for this program. Now, what do we also see? We saw a coach who is, as you say, very much a club coach. He's a guy who, who wants his guys to play a system. He wants people to fulfill certain roles. At club, you can go out, and if you don't like your right wing back, you can go buy another right wing back. That's not the case at the national team level. You have the pieces, for the most part, that you're dealt. You can recruit a few dual nationals, but you don't know what positions they play. That's kind of also dumb luck. So I think Burhalter is better fit for a club system where he can drill those guys every day. And what do you need at the international level? You need somebody who can manage big personalities. And I think we saw a little bit of problem for that with Burhalter with the likes of Gio Reyna and, and kind of how he handled that situation when it came to the injury or not injury or fitness or not fitness. And then beyond that, I think you need somebody that's a tactical freaking genius and not just a, not just somebody who can set you up to succeed when they've got two days or two months to prepare for an opponent, but somebody who can make split second decisions when things are getting out of control. I don't know if you saw the comments from Louis Van Paul, the Dutch manager after the game. He basically, you know, the Dutch are famous for being yeah. blunt. He basically said <laughs> the U.S. didn't adjust. They, they didn't adapt. 
And it was very true. Anybody who watched that game probably felt really good at, after the first eight or nine minutes. The Dutch goal falls. And then suddenly you realize, oh, wait, every time that we go forward, when we lose it, it's a counter. And the second one is coming. The second one is coming. And the second one will end this game. And Greg Berhalter didn't adjust. He thought his team was playing well. He kept sending him forward, which is courageous in some way. It's also naive. He kept sending him forward, kept sending him forward, kept sending him forward. And then what happens? The second goal falls at the most crucial time right before the half. And the game is effectively um, at that point over. And then whatever his plan was for the second half, which at one nothing, you can, you can kind of like gradually chase that goal. Now you've got to chase two against the Dutch side. You're basically, you have to make a quick adjustment. I don't know that Reina through the middle was necessarily the call. If you were going to go somebody through the middle, I would have gone Weah through the middle and let Reina play his, his more natural position. Weah is a guy who, even though he's not physically like strong gifted, he's physically fast gifted. And that could have given Van Dyke some problems. Van Dyke would have bullied him, but he might not have caught him to bully him. So right. I think the tactics there, when you get into knockout tournament football, like, let's be honest, we're judging Greg Berhalter here on four freaking games, four games. That's it. So you, you really, every minute, every second matters. And I think for this team to make that next jump, and I'm telling you, it's a big jump to 2026 and being, you know, a quarterfinal team. There's a huge gap between round of 16 and quarterfinals and beyond. I think you need somebody who is very, very good at in-game management. And I don't think Burhalter's there yet, but I think the U.S. team is exceptionally well set up. Everybody talked about this team, second youngest in the World Cup, golden generation. They're going to be 26, 27. That's a footballer's prime for the next World Cup. And there's a few positions, you mentioned the number nine, where like there's gaping holes. Central defense, there's going to be some big questions there moving forward because the two guys that were starting there were, were kind of older. But, you know, once you... Hey, Ruby, what's up, what's up, Mishaka? <laughs> good, good. We have roommates here for ESPN. Shaka Hislop, uh, legend. You're good, bro. Oh, yeah. You're good. <laughs> yeah, I think that's kind of the point, right? Is that like um, you look at this roster and you, you do the math and you think 2026, you think home World Cup, you know that they're going to be like kind of the, the top seed in their group. They're going to get all the advantages that, for instance, Qatar had this time. Qatar couldn't take advantage of it. And I think there's a chance with a good manager who can who can avoid the, the big pitfall there to get to a quarterfinal. From there, I think, you know, we're probably still not anywhere past that, even in a home World Cup. Um, but, but I think, you know, that there is room to grow both in the player pool um, and the managerial pool, I, I would say. Yeah, and the other thing, too, you talk about the ages. Like a guy like Pepe who gets left off this mm -hmm. roster, he's 19 years old. He'll be 23 at the next World Cup. You know, you have, uh, you know, I know there's this kid at Arsenal that's a dual national that, oh, that yeah. perhaps winds up coming. Everybody. Out. Yeah. So that one of our colleagues at ESPN is Julian Laurent. He's, he's French. He's like one of the top journos in France. And I asked him, I was like, yo, I've only seen highlights of this kid. Like, what's up? He's like, no, no, he's legit. And I was like, is he legit for like an American? He's like, no, no, he's legit, legit. Like, this kid is a serious number nine prospect. And, you know, you add a, a serious number nine on the edge of a team with all the guys that we've already talked about. And, and now you got something, you got something. And I, I just want to say one more thing on Burhalter because it's very, it's very poignant for me. Uh, I'm Mexican American. So I follow Mexico a lot and mm. you can also do much worse than Greg Burhalter. <laughs> so Mexico <laughs> last true. time around had a guy named Juan Carlos Osorio. Colombian manager and, and foreign managers in Mexico just get crushed. The press is, has tinges of xenophobia. They hate that there's anybody non-Mexican managing the team. They crush this guy, crush this guy. He qualified them for the World Cup, as they say in Mexico, caminando, walking. At a, it, was, it was easy, the last qualifying for Mexico. He got them through the group phase. They beat Germany, the World Cup defending champions, Germany in the group phase. And they went out in the round of 16. And eventually he leaves basically because the press has made it so toxic that everybody wants him out after the tournament. They go out, they pay double for Tata Martino, who had just come from Major League Soccer in Atlanta United, but had some big, you know, big successes on his resume. He, he managed Argentina, got him to a final. He managed Barcelona for a year. They had a good season, didn't win anything, but, but you know, that's still a big job. He took Paraguay to great success uh, in the 2010 World Cup. So, Everyone was like, this is the dude. This is the guy to get us to the next level. 
one of the worst qualifying campaigns in Mexican history and the worst World Cup in Mexican history since 1978, excluding ones where they were banned or didn't qualify. So the last time Mexico went out in the group phase was 1978, and they did it this time with their best ever, most, not air quotes, most yeah. expensive coach. So the U.S. Soccer Federation, if they're going to move on from Greg Berhalter, they got to know what's next, and they better nail it because you could do a lot worse. That's true, and Berhalter could also learn from this and become better. So that that's definitely something you can't rule out. He's he's clearly got some intangible qualities in terms of the environment he's created that that are positive that we highlighted earlier. Sebi, this was great as as expected. Uh, enjoy the rest of the tournament, my friend. Hopefully, I'll see you when you get back here stateside. Uh, thanks for doing this, and uh, we'll talk soon. Yeah, always a pleasure, Craig. 